What does your shirt say, Dave? World's tallest what? Leprechaun. Leprechaun. I'm offended on behalf of my people. <laughs> I kidding. got that from Rachel's mom. So listen, I'm an honorary it came from Irish. My people. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's it's kosher. <laughs> it's funny. We are Squawking Dead, a podcast pulverizing programs beyond the Walking Dead universe. Sometimes we give you news, sometimes we make you laugh, but most times we go deep. God damn it. <laughs> I'm your host, David Cameo, and I'm joined by Bridget, ko-fi.com slash punky brewster. That's P-U-N-K-Y-B-R-U-I-S-E-T-E-R. And today we're here to talk to you, but you know, I didn't do this yesterday. Hmm. I realized that. I said that Daryl did. We're back with Daryl Dixon. Oh, I didn't yeah, say, you didn't say the episode name I didn't name say the episode name. I should have because it's a great name is the kindness of strangers, which well, is... Well, I uh, said it, but I said it in English. I said, I'm going to butcher the name. La gentillesse des étrangers. Boom. Anyway, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about that today. We're talking talking today. (laughs) Today we're talking about From's second episode of the third season titled When We Go. Okay. As you could probably tell, uh, this episode made me very, extremely emotional. If it wasn't for Kenny repeatedly, Boyd embracing Tian Chen's body. And then even at some point, Henry Cavanaugh, this is the point where he's believing Tabitha. He's like, I have no choice but to conclude that what you're saying that is you're true. The truth. But he still says, he still says. So if you're lying to me, if you're if making this all, please tell me now, because the hope is the most dangerous thing. And that broke me. The fact that my boy is still out there in the wild after concluding that he'll never be back for 40 years. That's that's life imprisonment. So I wanted to throw that out there now. There's a reason for why I'm getting into this now, because hopefully as a professional podcaster, quote unquote, because this, <laughs> I'll get, have my S together enough to be able to give you an episode that's worthy of your attention and approval and all that stuff. I feel like I've given so many of my impressions to you, Bridget. I actually really, 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 really enjoyed this episode. I thought it was very sweet. There were lots of tension moments. I do fear that my theory is correct. All right. Let's that elaborate hope, on that theory. That hope kills this place and people are starting to lose hope. Right. Well, I, I think, think we kind of came to that I mean, conclusion together because I know the literal some hope, ground some hope being is coming poisoned. Back. Some hope is coming back because Jim and Kenny were able to find food, but it's like we don't even mention that again because the rest of the episode is right. just focused on Tian Chen's death and Kenny dealing with it and Chrissy dealing with it and Boyd dealing with it and the kids dealing with it and everybody dealing uh, with Jade it. Jade dealing with it. She was a big part of hope for that place because she tried to make it the most Tian normal Chen, that she could. I mean, yeah, Tian Chen yeah. made it. Why well, I said Tian Chen? Well, you just said Christy went back to Tian oh, Chen. Come so I wasn't sure oh, come on. Oh, about come this. on. What are audience members idiots? Come on, Dave. Dude, yeah, don't Hollywood. everything. Don't big time I'm them now. Explain everything. Yep. <laughs> All right, Dave, what was your impression? <laughs> I, I already kind of went into it just a second ago. We had some technical difficulties, but for all the naysayers, and even me at some point, finding value in the negatives of the series, of which there are, they are present. You have to kind of keep your eye on them. So some people will bother them more than others. So the fact that there are mysteries on top of mysteries, climbing on top of each other, clamoring for prominence in a world of mysteries. Right? Isn't that everything? Right? Podcasts. There's too many of them. <laughs> We've democratized music, podcasts, entertainment of all varieties. Yeah. So mysteries are, are everybody part of and that. their mom has a podcast now, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's a, my dumb joke is that you are registered for a podcast when you get your driver's license. Whether you make use of oh, it or okay. not, it's there for you if you want to. Yeah. Like registering to vote. I can't wait for the day that my mom actually has a podcast. They're on WhatsApp. They didn't even know how to use a computer, what, five years ago, six years ago? But they have WhatsApp and they're really good at it. They know how to take screenshots. They know how to take video recordings of their screen with sound. What is happening? Anyway, and I know that WhatsApp didn't help them do it. They figured it out. What? Anyway, going back to this episode, this place dies when you feel like you're, when you, not when you feel like you're, when you're beating it, when you have hope and you think you can beat the thing, this place starts dying. The ground is poisoned. The leaves start changing. The environment starts collapsing. It looks like autumn. Well, this episode, it looks like winter, but is it winter or is it this place is sunsetting? Word we used in the pre-show, by the way. And it could just be the fall of Rome. 
and that it's going to take a while for this place to actually die? Uh, is it going to take hundreds of years? <laughs> Probably not. We don't have time for that in this series. And I don't know if we can all hang in there watching them suffer along the way. But in its last gasps, it tries to break Boyd. Well, it does a number on the town. Tian Chen having passed everybody when Kenny and Jim walked through the streets, when they were carting Tian Chen's body earlier, everybody is upset and mournful. Everybody makes it to the funeral. It's not like in the past when the Matthews come in and there's a couple people from the town at the yeah. Pratt funeral. Megan and Lauren, Rachel says in the chat, because she can't come on because oh, she hates the you. series so much. Just kidding. She wants to be involved. She wants to see if she has a foot in the door somewhere. If we keep talking about it, maybe an angel will get its wings. So in its last gasps, it manages to produce enough fear, the fear that it loves going, that it loves so much, breaks Boyd to a point, breaks Kenny to a point. It's a little bit of satis extra satisfaction. It had dessert with Kenny. So it was enough to have these patches of cabbage and lettuce and, uh, near the banks where they were staying. And they brought it all back and see when this place gets to feed, so do the humans. When they feel like there's nowhere to run, there's no escape, there's no hope of leaving. It's saying, well, enjoy the feast that we've prepared for you so that we can prey upon you forevermore. All this place cares about is having a steady stream of fear with which to feed off of. No hope, fear. Well, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> And Rachel, you said there weren't any answers. This is a pretty clear answer, I think, to the question of at least how this place works. This wraps up this theory that we had talked about in the last episode, that when Abby said that to Boyd, it was actually the place fighting back and saying like, oh no, don't have any hope. Oh, fake Abby. Right. Yeah. This Fabby. place pushes back. Right. Fabby. <laughs> it's Fabby, Tabby, and Abby. Oh, and Fatty. Sorry, Fatty. Fatima. <laughs> And Tabby. Oh, that, <laughs> that reminds hilarious. me. We need to talk about the baby because, bro, is she going to give birth to a monster? I feel like it's a huge misdirect. And I'll tell you why. Because I wrote oh, a lot of notes Sharon. about I this. I love Sharon D too. I'm glad she's able to text. Oh, They well, probably yeah, drove course. somewhere to do so. I would assume. Honestly, you know what I really think? It's one thing for you to not have power. We expanded on this on the Walking Dead Daryl Dixon season two premiere. And We'll expand upon this more as the episodes release. But my biggest concern was her ability to make money, to get work, to continue mm. to feed herself, etc. Yeah, that course. was my big deal because, yeah, with all the roads being difficult to navigate, that's my that was my biggest concern because she does door dash yeah. deliveries and stuff like that. So, like Rachel says in the chat, pregnant women have weird appetites. Lol. I'm going to say the lol. Just, just want to, not going to imitate I mean, they her do, laughing. But like, There's no imitation. It's rotten food. I don't know, dude. Well, I do know, taking everything together from this episode, she is having what is described by Marielle as hyperemesis gravidarum, which is mm -hmm. basically severe morning sickness to the point of malnourishment, dehydration. Yep. I worked with a girl who had it and it was horrible. Yeah. Was constantly like the insult popping. to injury to our friend who had it was that she had severe postpartum. So it's like, you mm. think this thing is going to be the miracle and she finally gets pregnant and she has this hyperemesis gravidarum. And then when she has the baby, she's like, I am afraid I'm going to hurt it. So I need to go away for a little while. Mm, yeah, so, so that was the worst part about That's it. Hard. This episode is really hitting home, but I think because of what we see at the end, in some cultures, it is very, very common for, actually not even some cultures, around the world, there are many pregnant women, it's not very reported on, that have mm -hmm. pica. Pica yeah. is usually associated with the consumption of non-food items, but mm -hmm. for pregnant women specifically, check this out, it's soil and ice or snow or frost or sometimes the chips from the freezer basically mm -hmm. the ice chippings from the freezer if it gets too much frost in it they they crave it it's weird i ran across a ton of papers that speak on this specific issue how it's very not talked about in mm -hmm. pregnant women and so it's between this and that she can't smell can't taste normal food she just can't handle it but she can handle this and of course part of that is the rotten food but it could just be the soil itself that is nourishing here's the tip let me mention this one thing pica is derived from the latin word magpie which mm -hmm. is a common theme they're kind of related to the raven and the crow they're just a slightly more colorful raven but let's go back the rotten food we were all upset when, when we figured out that they were starving especially donna and she was very mm -hmm. upset this episode We'll go back to her. All hope was lost. But then you start thinking, just like this series does, what if this all happened so that Fatima could have something to eat? Yeah, for her monster baby. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm not sold that something's not right. I know it's too obvious. I know it's too obvious. But like, we've all been waiting for the other shoe to drop. She she can't get pregnant. She all of a sudden is pregnant in this horrible place. She's really losing her hope. And she is like such a bright light to everyone because she's so positive. And, oh, yeah. and she always says, if you don't look down, if you don't see the monsters, like this place is really beautiful. She sees it as the beautiful place that it can be. What a devastating blow would that would be if they really took her hope from her. Okay. I'm going to say this. Okay, you're hitting on something brilliant, by the way. It seems like this place is attacking the people who inspire the most hope out of most people. Mm -hmm. Boyd. Yes. Fatima. Tian Chen. I would say Donna and Tian Chen. Right. The three pillars mm -hmm. of society. Tian Chen yep. being in the middle of both colony, both uh, settlements, right? Because she feeds everybody basically, even when yes. colony house is destroyed. So they have this affinity and they stay in her house. Boyd on one side for the townspeople, Donna on the other side, or Fatima really, because that's why they're celebrating her one year anniversary, because it's Fatima. It's, she's the one who keeps everybody <laughs> together. Donna is just the Thank muscle, you. right? It's Fatima. No, no. It's Fatima. Anyway. <laughs> I'm, that's what Boyd says. Boyd calls her that. Okay. I'm not Boyd. He says Fatima, <laughs> but it's Fatima. But I'm just going to say this now, a couple episodes before the end. Fatima is okay. starting to lose it. Starts at the beginning of season two when the people from the bus die and they, she couldn't do anything to save them. No, it starts at the colony house deaths. Not quite though, right? It, of course. That's when it really starts for her because uh, yeah, all those guess, people die in front of her and right. she can't save anyone and she feels helpless. And then it's just kind of like one blow after another because people die. But she doesn't really say that she loses she hope. she can't until... stop the people who die from the bus, then what's his name gets stabbed. You know, it's like one blow after the other. This is the point I was trying to make is that I think it would have been more effective to not have her lose hope throughout all of season two, because I kind of forgot that she was supposed to be this hopeful person. I mean, of course, you can't forget the scene where they look out the window with Julie and she look out the window and she's trying to impart on Julie that this place can be heaven. As long as you look up, this place can be heaven. I forgot about that because oh. all of season two, she was just losing hope. That's fair. But right. if she was such a bright light, because she was often the proxy for the new people, you know, and she was right. light and was able to make people feel happy and kind of give them a good perspective to have on that place. And how even though it's horrible, you can still find beauty in the small things and like the brundles, like being able to look off into the distance and see all the beauty that's there. Yeah, it would be more effective if it all happened at once. But maybe that's the point. Maybe it's like, really, so that you have to pay attention to it. Because right, right. in real life, Dave, right. people don't always lose their hope like that. It can be a slow drain. That's a very good point. And Rachel said in the chat that Ellis did make an, a point to say that her light is gone. When did he say that specifically? It's in season like at two what point in the episode? at some point. I think that's what she's referring to. After Father Katri's death. Yeah, because that was the same night when they were trying to help the townspeople or sorry, the bus people. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's when Father Katri gets it. He's still credited at the end, by the way. I noticed that. Mm -hmm. he's, he's one of the first people that in the credits, by the way, the actor who plays Father Katri. Because listen, again, my favorite character. So, you know, it'd be kind of great. But And he's in the episode spiritually because it is the church where mm -hmm. they bring Tian Shen's body. And that was the other thing that made me cry. In Judaism, there's a thing called the Hever Kedisha. I know in most cultures or most Christian-based cultures, etc., Western culture, there's a mortician. And then they stick a thing up the neck and the fluids drain and the mm. right and they put in the I mean now that's like modern the, that's modern Yeah, now, now, now science, yeah. Didn't yeah, used to be that's that all way. I mean now. And then there's that and there's you know, they're, they're putting makeup and they're stitching up the things and they're gluing the eyes shut and all that stuff, whatever. But in Judaism, it's so sweet because they do it in this episode. They're literally doing what the Hever Kadisha do. They come in and they treat the body as if they were alive, just not talking, just not there to say things. If they bump an elbow, they say, oh, I'm so sorry. While they're prepping the body, they're gently mm -hmm. cleaning all the blood off with a washcloth. And when they have to undress her, they let's say it's we're talking about a her, they undress her and try to show as little as possible. Because if you were alive, you wouldn't want to be left mm -hmm. bare for people to see you. That's how they operate. I always found the Hever Kadisha role, which means literally the sacred society in, in English. They treat the body as though they were alive with the utmost dignity and respect. It's not just like, all right, let's just get this show on the road and put the clothes on and okay, let's just slather some paint on there and stuff like that. It's literally lovingly, respectfully treats them as they're alive, apologize along the way. Oh, they bumped the knee. Oh, I'm literally saying to the dead body, I'm so sorry. I'm so, I won't do that again. I'm so sorry. Well, I will say there may be a misunderstanding about 
their work is very delicate. I mean, they know that they're caring for someone's loved one in the process. So no matter what that process is, it is done with as much compassion and empathy as you can have. So, right, no, I, you know, I'm just saying that, that the, it's no, it's, I, I get what you're the, saying. The, There's like a level yeah, of tenderness. Yeah. I guess maybe that's required, you wouldn't expect to see, it. but yeah. Right. Cause like, let me put it this way. If you're at a mortuary in as much respect as you have for the body, right. You're going to undress the body and it's going to be laid bare and you're going to try to put the clothes. You're not going to take the extra effort of covering the nipple, let's say when not making certain Depends parts on exposed, what you know, you're not going to take that are, I extra. Guess. I can easily, I mean, honestly. That, let me put, this is more accurately. I can see a world in which they wouldn't go that far as to kind of, they'd just get the job done as respectfully as possible, Let's say but time is of corporate. the essence. There are corporate. So corporate mortuaries are probably, yes, I could agree with that. Dave. Right. Yeah. There's no imperative to to require that of, of you. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what I'm saying is, I guess, I love that this is a sacred society among the people who take that extra care. And I got to see that in, it's not something people get to see because that's their job. That's what they have to do. And it's so that other people don't have to do it. And I love that it was Christy and Jade and he was treating him like he treated, he must have treated his mom before. I mean, I'm sure he wasn't a kid cleaning up the body, but I'm sure he would have wanted to. Yeah. And he didn't want to leave her alone, just like he didn't want to leave his mom alone in France, his dead mom and in the grandmother. His parents had passed when he was a kid and he was sent to live in France with his grandmother. With his grandmother. Okay. But that's his last mother figure. It's the same thing. It's still applicable. And he didn't yeah. get to take her when he left. He literally looks down at her body as if speaking mm -hmm. to her again, the Hefer Kadisha. I'm speaking to you as though you're here. We'll take yeah. you when we go. I was a wreck. I love that they took the time to show the care mm -hmm. for the body. Christy still holds love for Kenny, even though He's, she's with what's Marielle. Her, and what's her face is back. She was actually more. She, she was, was actually more likable in this episode, actually, because the demons are out of her <laughs> in more ways than one. Well, maybe that was intentional too, by the way, just to mention that on the side. I don't want to go into it, but sorry that Marielle's demons, for all intents and purposes, are gone now. And so she's more likable this episode than prior episodes. She is. Yeah, exactly. Rachel said, we'll see about that. I'm still hesitant because addiction doesn't just go away. It's not to say that you can't have like a spiritual awakening through a near-death experience and be like, I'm done with that. I'm not going to do that anymore. But... Yeah, it'll be a daily fight for her. I agree. Because even when she said like, oh, I'll go look to see if we have something to give you for the nausea. I was like, bro, you are able to get back into the locked cabinet again? Are y'all dumb? I was not thinking about that, to be honest. That's all Which I could is to think say, of. I guess so interesting because she was so convincingly pleasant and just doing everything right with a justifiably worried parent because he's thinking yeah. what we're all thinking. Demon baby. <laughs> monster baby monster baby well i say demons because there's a clear sense of good and evil in this place and there's oh, a yeah. or a duality of good and evil with everything that happens her rotten food being her sustenance is so interesting and in telling her about monster this place baby. her monster baby so again mariel was so convincingly pleasant to everybody in that moment that i completely yeah. forgot about her addiction she does mention it but i didn't I did connect not. going to the medicine cabinet i did not Christy still he... loves Kenny and that that was made oh, yes. evident through this care and tenderness. And yes, she loved Tian Chen also, but she says, I have to do this for Kenny. I can't let him see her like this because she knows that he saw his dad. What a scarring moment that would be. And so he, she wanted to like fix this part if she could. Right. I just thought that was really nice. And I thought, I don't know what's going to happen with any of these characters. I have no idea, but. I hated that they got us to a point where I thought maybe they would get to be together. And it's not even a bad thing that ha happens. It's just a thing that happens. Yeah, and her fiance shows up. And Kenny's like so respectful about it and stays away and keeps his distance as to not make things awkward for Chrissy. He's just a really good guy. Or Mariel, because so, that wouldn't be fair. Yeah. He loves her. And that's how you show that love is by being like, you're with your fiance. And so I'm just going to leave you alone. He doesn't know Mariel. He's just a really, really good guy. He takes, the point is he takes Christie's lead. It's like, whatever you decide to do, I'll love you either way. It doesn't matter who this person is. She could be not good for you. That's not my decision to make. That's true love. It's Ugh, true it's unrequited love, it's which is the worst. It's not beautiful. It it's worst. terrible. 
No, the unrequited part is horrible. Yeah, it makes it comp- see just like this place. It's true love, but we gotta make it unrequited because that's how this place works. What we a don't great know. feeling we to have. We don't know yet that it's fully unrequited either, because there was. Oh well, yeah. She was see, torn because we assume that she she's was guilt ridden, right? Yeah, she was torn, but as soon as her fiance shows up, she knows that she has to do the right thing. Right. And that's and as great. Soon as Tian Shen that's great dies. too. That's the thing. Like everybody's making the right choice. I don't like it, but like how realistic. Right. And that brings us to Boyd and Donna in a way, because Bro, if I could have reached through the screen okay. and punched Donna in the face, I would have. I was so mad. I was like, Thank you. I was like, dude, Thank you. check yourself for real. What do you mean? You just went on a rampage the day before about how everybody's gonna die because there's nothing left to eat and how this place is miserable and it doesn't even matter. You might as well just curl up and, and just kill yourself. And and then all of a sudden you're Literally like, was it worth says. it? Was it worth it to go get that cow that got killed? Was it worth it, Boyd? You got Tian Chen killed. Right, we congratulations. are. We're the family. <laughs> it's like, wow, dude. <laughs> really? I want to be fair because just like the show does in mo- that most shows don't do, sometimes the thing is said. It's what we all thought, too, yeah. is like, it's not worth saving the animals to sacrifice the people. We all know that. What? They would have gone off into the woods? Okay, well, maybe you could have found them again. Was it really that big of a deal? They were so worried about starving that the natural reaction was to panic and immediately go after them. So then in that respect, Donna is the audience insert. So by yeah, inserting course, yeah. her into that scene, you automatically get disgusted as the audience. I would, well, I would never say what Donna just said. Yes, you would have had she not said it. <laughs> You legitimately would have said it. Am I wrong? Honestly, any podcast that is covering this probably said it last episode. So not us. Right. But any other podcast. How prescient. How prescient. Because I think it was one of you. I don't know who said it. It was probably you, Bridget. Blind's like the savior and you're supposed to do the thing. He's like the savior trope. Oh, yeah. Because I said like he's it's a trope and he just walks in and he's like everything he does is perfect. And he has all the solutions. He solves all the problems. And so that was kind of free. You you are the nice version of that. Like, well, I get it. You know, it's fine. I get it. You know, it's okay. And he is kind of cool. He seems to have it together. Right. Still. It's genius writing, genius level writing, anticipating the audience reaction. But I wanted to just mention this because as long as we're trying to be funny right now, it's serious, but it's also kind of funny. The way Donna comes down the hill when she first arrive on the scene <laughs> is absolutely, for all of last episode's tremendous not funniness, that was the funniest thing about this episode. Boyd, 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 like yelling at the top yeah. of her lungs. Is it true? It was like, it's like, what are you? What is this? A Christmas carol? Is it Christmas, Tim? <laughs> is it Christmas, Tiny Tim? You're like, what are you doing? What well, you and doing? like in front of everyone, like, could you have Tosses some a sense? coin to Tiny Tim because it's Christmas? Jeez, could you have some sort of sense of decorum, like in composure? Everybody thinks that you guys are going to starve to death, and you're like, is it true? <laughs> like, I don't know. It was <laughs> exactly. It was. Everybody's very already funny. on edge. It was very Christmas Carol. <laughs> that is fair. That was the only thing that upon watching this episode again didn't make me cry. It actually made me laugh harder because when you see it, you can't unsee it. Now, credit to Elizabeth Saunders' commitment. You can't yeah. fault the commitment to her character. Yeah. I know Ooh, that she probably embraced. caught some flack over that those lines. Often people can't separate the character from the actor. I'm not going to be the one. The actor. So I'm sure that she caught some flack online for saying that. But we but all thought it. We all thought it. We did think I, it maybe a little bit. Yeah. But you know what the funny thing is that for as much flack as we initially gave her, she does come back around and says the thing. She says, oh, immediately. I'm mad at me. I'm immediately. Mad. She goes, that's the, that's the best part is that Boyd is like, literally, you just had this conversation with me yesterday. You were just freaking out. And she goes, okay, okay, okay. You're right. And she turns it around immediately. And I was like, I'll give her that. The woman that's can. a authentic. Because yeah. we were just saying how authentic it is that Christy has to do the thing. She has to be with her fiance. And that it's also true that she may, she is, she loves Penny. Penny loves her, but there's an order of operations here, right? Marielle is in the parentheses, so that order comes first, and then comes the multiplication. You remember the order of operations for mathematics? Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is they're doing the right things, but sometimes the right thing makes you suffer. But what this show does really well is they say the thing, they react to the thing, then they come back just like we would in real life 
life. In real life, we have the argument. It's not that they walk away and we let them walk away to cool off a bit. And then an episode later, they come back, you know, I was thinking about it and things. No, that doesn't happen in real life. What happens in real life is you say the thing and you go, I'm sorry I said that thing. Let's or talk about... you sulk off what? for 20 minutes and then you come back and you're like, I'm sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> and then maybe at the end of the season, they'll apologize because, you know, the thing has been resolved. Well, now the thing yeah. is resolved, the thing that we were worried about. Well, you know, I just want to say I'm sorry for the conversation we had earlier. I didn't yeah. really mean it. I was just, okay, that's funny because Nikki apologizes to, to Fatima it didn't for being very mean sincere, in the last episode. But yeah. I'm trying to decide... It- <laughs> No, it may have been the delivery of the line. I'm not really sure. At first, I was like, oh, that's nice. But then she says like, oh, well, it's okay. Like everybody's stressed <laughs> out. And she's, like, and she's like, doesn't give me a reason to be a, a D-bag or whatever she said. And I was well, yeah, like. Something to that effect, right. And I was like, I don't like that. Something about that rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> if you and I were in this argument, I'd be right back in it. I'm going to attribute that to. They're not paying this actor. Acting. I don't know. As much as the other actors. That's right. That's That's all I'm going to say about that. Because no, the rest of the 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 rest of the delivery has been great. One line, just one line, rubbed me the wrong way. That's all. That's all. (laughs) Just like well, in real life, right? No judgment. That's the thing. Because I'm, I get like real prickly, you know, around people sometimes. So if they gone out of their way to apologize, and I was like trying to be gracious to say no no, it's okay. Everybody's stressed. It's not a big deal. Which, mind you, I'm still probably pretty mad that you're being such a bee in the hallway about the bathroom, but fine. Try to be the bigger person. But I've got bigger problems also. And then so I'm, I'm trying not to be the bigger person. So then you're like, yeah, doesn't give me an excuse to be a D-bag. I'd be like, no, we're in this again now. Now I'm still mad at you. I don't like the way that you delivered that. Uh, I'm, I feel a little me. triggered, Bridget, because I feel like this happens to us sometimes. <laughs> You and me. Sometimes yeah, I think you yeah, want me Rachel, to figure it out. You apologize and Sometimes you wrong. come out and say it. But I like that the conversation that Boyd has with Donna is reflected in the conversation that Nikki has with Fatima at the end. I like that it's authentic. Even Nikki's apology, take from it what you will about whether it was sincere or not, is authentic. Maybe it was intentional too. Maybe that was like an intentional way to deliver that line. I think so too, actually. Maybe. Because she is a rando. She's just being a rando. (laughs) Well, and on top of that, it's like, you'd still be pissed that she was taking up the bathroom for so long. Well, yeah, right. Even if you're like, you're trying to do the nice thing because you all live in communal living, you know, you gotta be, gotta get along with everybody. You all live together in one big house. Right. She should be used to this. Right. Yeah. See, it's her way of saying in the most indirect way possible or undetectable way possible. Not that I was wrong. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think that's why it made me mad. I was like, "Mm." That's it. But then, That's it. In, like hidden under mountains and mountains of nice words to say, there's no stank. Yes, <laughs> but thank she's you. Like, Rachel said she all, said that line. Like, oh, I wasn't wrong about it. She said that line like she was actually calling Fatima a dick. <laughs> That's we say, exactly say it, how- now exaggerate when you say Fatima. <laughs> no, it's, it's a huge house and it can't only have one bathroom. That can't be real. Oh, it might be though. Maybe it's an old house. Well, That's okay. That's the seventh hold on a layer of hell is a 14 bedroom house with one bathroom. Listen, they make this house seem to we be don't know that it has, it has more than 14 bedrooms, by the way. I just want to say that out loud. But if you remember the first season, though, the way the monsters, the they, got into the house was in the bathroom when, what's his yeah. name, let his girlfriend in, right? His girlfriend. So maybe that bathroom what is a like, loser that we guy just was. didn't bother cleaning that one up. <laughs> You know oh I mean? yeah, maybe. <laughs> or the one where she's really sick is that bathroom, and that's why she's sick. Anyway, I'm just sorry. Moon wears pants. Sorry, I'm dialing it back. She's I'm sick because of the monster baby, Dave. It's just a monster baby. It's monster fine. Monster baby. I, see, the reason why I mentioned the pica with hyperemesis gravidarum is that it's totally explainable. We and Ellis and Fatima and everybody and their mother, except for Marielle, because she's being nice enough. She's trying to say the she's things. Fine, I she guess. doesn't know that it's a monster baby. But I think everybody and their mother is thinking it and is not saying it out loud. Just like in the first two seasons, everybody's saying everything's going to be okay. And what does Ellis do just after Marielle says, oh, hyper Emesis Gravidarum? He says, you hear that little one stroking the clearly not pregnant actor. <laughs> it's going to be, you're going to be okay. Do you hear that? Because he stomach? wants to believe it. I- Since we sort of talked about Marielle and 
she's not being as sus as she has been, and we don't mm-hmm. like the actor for some reason. Again, we don't want to say the thing out loud. She's probably a perfectly nice human being in real oh, life. Oh, yeah, no, but, I've got nothing against her. I know nothing yeah. about her. And we right. really don't know much about her as a character other than she's a, an addict. That's it. Right. And she's also, like, get, keeping Kenny and Christy apart, so that's part of <sighs> it, too. Sure, why not? This is the replacement for Kenny? This? Anyway, <laughs> she's so. This pukey, stringy-haired lady? Come on, now. <laughs> Right, exactly. No, we we all do I, it. I'm sure she's lovely. Exactly. You and me are so nice. We're so nice. We're good people, Bridget. <laughs> we're just good people that think bad thoughts. As but I'm we're like, good I would have punched Donna right in the face if I could have reached <laughs> the screen. <laughs> no, we're really good people. We're just so nice. Well, we never got to the end of the road on the conversation with Boyd and Donna because... I wanted to just insert the fact that as much as you and I are on the same page about Donna, even though she apologized, even though she, but she kind of does the thing that Nikki does, which is underneath all of that kind of lets out a fart. And what that fart smells like is similar to what she said to Jade or Jim about the radio. I just don't want to want you to give these people false Jim, hope. Jim, she said it to Jim. I'm, we're yeah, we're gonna have to clean all that up. And also, people are gonna Dave, die because of this. I hate when you make fart analogies. <laughs> well, pro- unlike Nikki, she let out a little fart that smells something like rotten food. But it, that's I what hate it is. This. It's rude. It's rude. It's awful because Boyd has just been through a trauma. It's that's me being nice, calling yeah. it a fart. Because it's awful. It's ironic. For all her talk is we are all we have. And mm-hmm. Boyd just saw a woman be tortured, murdered, brutally murdered. Yeah. He was the one extending the olive branch by reaching out to her and trying to tell her by her his physical actions that we are all we have. She goes, don't touch me. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, I get it. It is authentic. Mm-hmm. But ironically, even though you have this weird animosity to boy towards boy, and I wrote this in big letters in a more general sense, but even though you have so much animosity towards him, which is the reason why you set up Colony House in the first place, you regard him as the man with the answers. You still look to him for answers. You still take your lead from him. I know that you run your place the way you see fit. That's great. But when things start getting bad, You constantly go to Boyd for the answers. Yeah, of course. Who is the person you should be embracing first? Boyd. I know. There hasn't been a lot of uh, comfort for him. He hasn't received much in the way of comfort. Now, to be fair, he wouldn't be very receptive of it right now. I think there's some level of like, I deserve this. There's some sort of like self-deprecation kind of thing. But I think that's what makes the moment between Kenny and him so nice is that he tells Kenny... Has saved this because you could hear him at the beginning of the episode. Jade finds him. He's been there for how many hours? We don't know. And he is Not repeating sleeping. the same line over and over and over again. And Dave, you had translated part of it. You had caught the latter half of it, which is the he will be alone now. So the first half was take care of him because right, he'll right, be the alone. first part. So when Boyd gets to finally let that out and share that with Kenny, there's such a beautiful moment there because Kenny's kind of like, how would you know how she died or whatever? And Boyd has to go through this horrible moment of explaining to Kenny what had happened and how they were tricked and how he had to sit there and watch as he and Chen was like just literally eviscerated. Like I know I use that word a lot when I'm talking about like emotionally eviscerated, but I'm like physically. It's the translation. Eviscerated. Actually, it is literally yeah. what Vis- was happening. She's turned into viscera. Yeah, that's when you finally see someone. It's like Kenny in that moment takes that in and like hates that that happened to his mother. Hates that she's gone. Hates that she's dead. But he also hates that it happened to Boyd. Appalled okay. at the act of it. I'm so glad you said this because it is in my notes. One of the things that we had, I didn't. For, well, for, I had said that because it, I it thought, might go that way. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's take a step back. You had said it wouldn't be that unusual for Kenny to throw it back in boy's face. Mm-hmm. Right. Completely understandable. Yeah. I had said, I think it would be a little tropey. But what I'm glad is that when, oh man, I'm, why am I getting emotional? But let me, let me read what Rachel says first. It was very bittersweet. I can't even imagine the wave of emotions knowing his mother wasn't alone in her final moments, but also Boyd witnessed what happened. And it's the latter part that I want to focus on more because what I saw in Kenny's face was not only that she wasn't alone, sure, that's something, but it's also horrible for Boyd. You don't think that Kenny cares about Boyd? 
that he sees him as sort of a father figure and that he had well, to go yeah, through course. that? The he two lo- most I mean, important people in his life right now? He loves Boyd. That's very clear. Kenny's changed a lot since the first season, but he was Boyd's shadow because he respected him. It was the father figure that he had, but that he had lost, not because he had passed, but because his mind had gone. And right, so right. And who Kenny, extended the olive branch first? Kenny found this in Boyd. And so for him to know that his mother wasn't alone in her final moments, which is beautiful, but that Boyd had to see the severity of it. I think it Take was it very out. evident through Ricky He's, thank you for looking up his name, his acting in that moment that they didn't have to state it. This is what I mean when I'm constantly complaining oh, about yeah. like, show, don't tell, show, don't tell, show, don't tell. The audience isn't that stupid. We're not that dumb. Well, some people are. I'm not. Dave isn't. Rachel and Sharon aren't. At least you got the four of us to watch your show and understand what's happening. His- We're the only people in the world that have <laughs> smart thoughts. <laughs> All of you are I dumb. ain't no smooth brain. <laughs> Sprain's got mad wrinkles. I'm sorry I'm adding levity to this because I feel uncomfortable. It was beautiful because you got to see in his facial expressions as he's processing this information, as he's receiving it, just how appalled he was that Boyd had to go through this and that he was forced to go through this and that he had to do it alone. Right, and... Who has time to express all these things in words? It would have been inauthentic for there to be words. You know what, Boyd? I'm feeling very appalled that you had to witness this by yourself. I wish that I could have been there. That's Fear Season 8 writing. I just wrote a script for Season 8 of Fear just now. It was great. It was really good. Moving moving along. But you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And also, that's not how life works, first of all. And second of all, appalled is the word, but there's another word. He's processing the fact that his mom was tortured and that she was tortured in front of someone and the monsters used her as a pawn in their game, which how fitting is that? Because he played chess with his dad and they're all pawns in this game that this evil place is playing. And I implore the audience to go back and at least watch that moment so that you can really kind of bathe in the just phenomenal acting that Ricky, he exemplifies in that moment. In that moment specifically, but in several moments, just And I love how when he initially hears the news, well, or is trying Mm. to... They're trying to tell him he's just yelling. What people are about to say. He's yelling yeah. at the house, mom. And, yeah. Yeah. Because oh. he already knows. He's having a hard time. Ricky, he does a phenomenal job at doing this, but it also, I feel like him and Harold Perrineau got together and mm. discussed how they were going to be after this event. And in many ways, they exhibit the same behaviors. They stop mid sentence. Yeah. They feel like they're about to say something, don't know if it's appropriate for them to say it stop saying it, says something else, but, or feels like they're about to say something, doesn't, doesn't say anything at all. It's a realistic reaction yeah, in grief, you know, when you're trying to express to someone else exactly what it was like to go through it, or we're trying to comfort someone who's going through something. It's really natural to start and stop. I'm, I'm literally doing it through this conversation as I'm trying to talk to you, because it is normal for as humans for us to to take a second to process what we would like to say, to put together the perfect sentence that we want to form and, and how much gravity that holds in a situation like this. You don't want to say the right. wrong words. Where there's a multitude of things happening. And so many people expect so much from Boyd, and he knows it, which is why he has a much more difficult time than Kenny. Fair. Even Kenny doesn't know what how he's supposed to be in this moment. And that is evident in the way he's trying to... I feel like grab onto and it's why he goes to the diner. It's like where the nexus of all his mom's best attributes come from that Mm -hmm. everybody knows. He's sitting at the counter. He's like, that's where I would be watching her do her thing, making people happy, even though sometimes she's yelling at people. But these are the things that are very endearing about his mom. Girl from Colony How Sorry, because I do not know the character's Clara? name. But the, Clara. Clara, yes, bicycle Clara. girl. A bicycle the girl. I, she's she's bicycle been hilarious from, from the beginning because Jade takes her bike and she's like, hey, that's my bike. Yeah. I love that she brought Excuse flowers me. to the diner. What a sweet and caring act that was. The body is eviscerated. We're not quite at the point where we're ready for a funeral, but she wants to do something. And so this little act was all she could think of. She's often seen in the background doing like little things. I just think it's a really nice touch. I thought it was very sweet. And it prepared Claire's for the key that. To this whole thing. <laughs> it prepared <laughs> that sorry. moment for Kenny knowing that, that there are other people that care about his his mother. There yeah. are other people Rachel there. Rachel says she's the Barbara from The Walking Dead, <laughs> by the way. 
immediately after Christy leaves to take care of Tian Chan with Jade as the Hever Kadisha, the juke comes on and plays Celebration by Cool and the Gang. Oh, God. I think we all thought the same thing. W-T-F. Because in almost every single moment that the radio does come on or the juke does come on, Mm -hmm. it's actually prescient. Somehow, oh, I received a sign or, yeah, that was our song or this or that. Mm -hmm. or People hear things that are apropos for the moment. Yes. When this comes on, it was very, very different. It really was. And I I wanted to get your thoughts on that too, because it's not cut and dry. I'm with Kenny. I'm like, I would be doing the same thing. Like really F you, really F you place. Rachel just said this. It feels like a taunt. It picked the absolute lowest moment to play just this ludicrous song, not by ludicrous, just a song that's ludicrous. And Luda. no, not Luda. <laughs> <laughs> and so it felt so inappropriate. Now, if I'm to take a step back and I look at it and I'm like, okay, you just came back from the wild. You live to tell the tale. And then also you uh, brought back that's food. survivor's guilt. You brought back food though. I'm You're looking supposed at to it, be the hero. If I'm looking at it from that perspective and I'm not paying attention to the rest of the stuff that's happening, if I'm just looking at that baseline, then it does feel apropos to the moment. You came back. You were going to be the big hero. You had the food. Everybody could be okay. And it's ruined by this other moment. It's a ludicrous song, Dave. And Rachel would have ruined it further. If she said, I would have died if they played fantasy. I want to lick, 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 lick you from, from your, your head, head to, to your toes. toes. I don't and I want really to move from the bed down, right to the, down to the down to the floor. And I want to... So you know what? Good, you, you know, know what? If that song did play... No, 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 no. What's your fantasy to see? You know, if they did play that song... Yeah. It would have been because it was Christy. And that would have been, I think, <laughs> I don't know what would have been worse, right? Because she, he'd be like thinking about, there's such guilt behind that. He's thinking about Christy in this terrible uh, moment. Right, anyway, my thought on that. Good thing they didn't do it, Rachel. <laughs> good, good thing they didn't. But I too took a step back and said to myself, sometimes a song isn't just a song. Maybe. Okay. So sometimes when I look at songs, I don't look at just what the meaning is behind the song. I look at the context in which they were written, where the group or the band was at, when they wrote it, what they said at the time it was about. Sure. So Ronald Bell, well, he was the sax player. He's also known as Callis Bayan. It might be his Muslim name. I'm not sure. But he told Billboard that the song came out of a time of religious study. Quote, unquote, the initial idea came from reading the Quran. He he explained, I was reading the passage where God was creating Adam and the angels were celebrating and singing praises. That inspired me to write the basic chords and the line, everyone around the world, come on, let's celebrate. That's surprising to me. I know. So often it's played at weddings and bar mitzvahs and all these times where like, be glad that you're alive. The feel of it doesn't describe the awesomeness. Like when we talk about that, I always talk about like feeling awestruck by the power of God and the multitude of his, the heavenly host. I don't hear celebrate, you know what I mean? Like, but, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you go to heaven and that's what's playing. I don't know. Girl, do not even make me recite the lyrics because in, in that song, it's the good times and the bad times too. It is literally where the scene opens and he, she, he says to Christy, the second scene where they're in the diner and he's at the counter. And no matter how bad it gets, we'll never have this day again. That's literally Mm -hmm. the song. Make the most out of every day. Let's celebrate. Because you'll never have this day again. Make this day oh, count. It's right? like she was speaking to him through it. Exactly. So that's why I was... And had I not done that, had I not taken that step back yeah. and actually looked at the source, why that was written, look at the actual lyrics for the good times and the bad times too, I wouldn't have achieved that. Again, we're going back to authenticity. The arguments, even the Nikki one with Fat- Fatima. It's authentic. You're hearing this and you're not processing the fact that, wait a minute, it's literally what my mom would say. Celebrate. Good times and bad, because you're never going to get this day again. So make it count. From the opposing side of it, no day will ever be this bad again. That's the other thing. This is the the day that he lost his mom. He will never. Yeah, I just, you know, you would focus on that side. I wanted to focus on the other side of it. But the end result is the same. It is. No matter how bad things get, you'll never have this specific day again. Mm -hmm. Where it was this bad, because it could be bad, but not as bad, or it could be worse. What's what many people say, with which my wife hates when I say it. It could be worse. Shut up. Who cares? It's bad now. So <laughs> that's it, it's, what I'm saying is it's it, upon reflection, the song choice is apt. It that's fits. It doesn't sound like it fits. No. It's a terrible timing, perhaps. But like I said, maybe I go and to heaven goes, and that's what's playing. 
Wouldn't that be something? That actually so feels it goes like to my the larger own part. personal hell. But all right, I've worked a lot of weddings. Well, listen, so. <laughs> when you get to heaven and the song plays, no day will be as bad as that one. And then anyway, all the other days will be great. So my point is, though, it goes back to the original premise of the show. Again, this is the one answer that we seem to have also, along with this place being affected by the collective hopes of everybody here. If they have a lot of hope and they're beating it, the place starts to wither. The ground starts to be poisoned, which is bad for them because if they don't get out in time, they'll starve. Every good comes with some bad. Every bad comes with some good that maybe the bad is good. Maybe the good is bad. Fatima, it may just be Pika. And the fact that crops all spoiled was good for her. She has three months worth of food just for her. What is three months? The first trimester to eat this rotten food for her to survive off of, let's say, perhaps. Every blessing seems to come with a curse. And every curse seems to have an underlying blessing with it. That's an answer. It's, and I feel like I have to ask the question again, would you prefer a show spell it out? And sometimes you do. Depends on the show. Or would you rather have it revealed in such a way that you can derive meaning from it? And that maybe in some ways that resonates with you more than them saying the thing out loud. Which is, I think, Bridget, if I'm on the money on this, is why we like this show so much. Because sometimes you have to look for the meaning. It's not about having the yeah. answer. That's well, yeah, I do like to that. To see what's there and not be like some rabbis and clergymen going after a natural disaster. This is what it means. This is the answer. No, I don't want they the answer. It. I want to be able to look. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to be able to look at a tragedy or thing and come to that myself, not say the thing undelicately out loud. But that's not for you to say out loud indelicately to a bunch of people. Whatever worries that you have about Fatima having a monster baby, they're not saying the thing out loud because they're all afraid to say it out loud. Because when mm -hmm. you say it out loud, you name it and it's real. Yeah. It's like everybody in this town has been saying, has been trying not to say out loud that it, it's not going to be okay. They, and they said it in this episode too. Boyd embraces Kenny. Let's go, let's go back. Okay, let's go back. You, you're all right. You're all right. You're not all right. You're not all right. Your mom just died. You want to kill these yeah. monsters, but you just can't seem to because you know that it's impulsive. And Boyd would have followed you, but you didn't know that Boyd was there with your mom. And so he's I'm going through something too. And he's just Boyd doing this to make you happy. played through that though. I'm glad he played through that. He's like, Because I'm yeah. sure he feels it too. Hell yeah. Let's go burn them down, dude. They're not even there, but like, I'll go with you. Because I don't, to the gates I don't, of hell. I want to deal with it too. I really like that that played out the way that it did. And he was right. Jade went in there and didn't see a single monster. They've probably moved. Wasn't it great that they brought that up? Because it's something yeah. that you would have kind of forgotten. Because he saw a bunch of S. Yeah, because you're like, dude, but where are I've the monsters? Completely like, forgot why that he didn't there? see the monsters. Yeah, yeah. We haven't really talked about Sarah at all, and we kind of skipped over her in the last episode too. Other than to mention that she played a really critical role there in saving. Didn't say Julie and Matthew's Ethan. Kids. Yeah. So we get a really great scene between Julie and Sarah that I enjoyed, where Julie essentially says, "Like I'm worried that this thing, whatever's here, is in my head now, and living rent free. I don't want to." And then Sarah says, "It's all right. You can say what you want to. I don't want to become like you." And she goes, "I wouldn't want to be me either." Yeah, I know. Which I was like, <laughs> yeah. "Man, Sarah, like as much as I disliked you in the first season, they're making it really hard." To continue to, to hate her, her the way that I did. She's so pathetic that, and well, so sad. Like, yeah, that's and why we you're automatically like, are revulsed by that. Yeah. I enjoyed that moment because, again, it was a very real and honest communication. And Julie hasn't really been able to speak about what happened to her with anybody. So nobody knows what she feels, how she feels. None Sorry. of them have, which is weird there to me that they haven't sought each other to talk about it. So maybe we'll see that further into the season. I'll Can be interested to see. you even imagine what that would look like? I don't know. I you No, know, it's weird. It's like a weird grouping. I mean, Randall grouping. does save... It's a weird grouping of people. And Randall is the worst. That's the thing. When I talked about him, it's like on paper, he looks like he would be such a good guy because he was like traveling to see his nephew. Hero. And, you know, he bought him a drone and he's like this sweet guy. And then he acts like such a self-centered D-bag that you're like, right. no, this guy sucks. Well, because we're all self-centered And then he saves, he saves the Matthews kids and Sarah. And you're like, okay, I guess maybe he isn't that bad. So you kind of go back and forth with him. I just want to say, 
isn't it in the same respect that Sarah and Randall are a lot alike? Because we're so quick to judge them yeah, in for some what degree, they sure. tried to do to the people that we care about on the show. Yeah, I'll give you that. It, there's some symmetry there. It would be a weird pairing to have Julie, Randall, and Mariella together. I Marielle. Think Marielle. I, see, I'm sorry. There was a kid at school named Mariella, and so that's the name that's in my head. So I think it would be a weird pairing. I have pairing a cousin to, named Marielle, and I, I, have flub it, I flub it all the time in <laughs> It my would head. be weird to have them all three together because... They have no connection to each other at all. And they haven't really interacted with each other at all. Even though Randall and Marielle came from the same bus, their interaction has been like next to nothing, if at all. Hold on a second. There's there's some interesting thing with numbers going on here because, okay, who are the three people that suffered in this episode, two episodes? It's, well, there's Tian Chen who died. The people that give other people hope. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tian Chen, yep. Boyd, mm-hmm. and Kenny. Yeah. Right? Not Donna. F, F her. Because <laughs> she <laughs> lost the plot somewhere along the line. But those three people, who are the three people who are chosen? Julie, Randall, mm-hmm. and Marielle. Marielle. Right? Yeah. It's the threes. There's something with threes that I think we should keep our eye on. Well. Why is it threes? Hmm, the Trinity. Say I don't it. know. Anyway, hmm. we'll move on from that. Or, um, or was it bad things come in threes? Uh, celebrity deaths come like in threes. That. Bad things come in threes. Nothing good happens after 3 a.m. Sarah really has been not even a reluctant hero, but just like a reluctant human being who happens to save the kids. And then in this episode, she comes in with the dress. She finds out that Tian Shen died. She wants to contribute in some way. So she goes to the diner, looks through the storage, finds this dress, and brings it to Christy and Jade, who are cleaning up. Tian Chen's body. And it was a nice moment between Christy and Sarah as well, because one, Sarah goes all the way down there to tell her, hey, Tian Chen died. I feel like you should know. Christy doesn't want anything to do with her. I liked that Sarah thought of her enough to do that. I thought that was very kind. And again, it makes it hard to hate her because she really is trying to repent for what she's done. And then she finds, yeah, she finds the dress and she brings it to Christy and Christy actually thanks her, which is, I think, a pretty big breakthrough in that relationship, in that dynamic. And Sarah tells this story that when the diner was slow, Tian Chen and her would go into the storage, which is in the back of the diner. There's a secondary storage shed as well, but this is where a lot of the storage is, is in the oh, back of the Oh, where the Matthews got their clothes from. Yes, because the they go uh, to like a secondary shed that's full of stuff, which right. I think is behind Tian Chen's house. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm not behind, 100% behind sure. Dine, I think it's behind the diner because I think it's also behind... Remember when Tom was getting the tools for Tabitha to dig in the basement? Mm-hmm. So it must be behind both of those properties. Somewhere along somewhere. there. So there's a shed back yeah. there and that's where the rest of the storage is. But the bulk of the storage is in the back of the diner. They would dress up together. Something to kill time, but also to make you feel like you're just part of the regular world again, which is nice. It was a nice... Right. I don't mind this show, Don't Tell, or Tell, Don't yeah, Show. It was, it was a nice, sweet daughter-mother moment in in the loosest terms, but Tian Chen did view her as her, as a daughter. She did care for Sarah. So it was very sweet to hear this story. Now, what I thought was interesting is that the dress that she showed was this beautiful white and blue dress, not a full length. It was like a, a mid-length, like a T-length dress. And you see later, after Tian Chen is put in the dress and is all cleaned up, that the ceramic that they put her picture on that's at the altar at the front of the church during the funeral has a picture of Tian Chen in it. And she is in that in the dress. dress. And so I thought about that briefly. Yeah. Okay. I think what that kind of drove home for me is that that was Tian Chen's dress. She owned that dress. That was hers at one point, but she put it into storage because that was the right thing to do. And when she was playing so dress up, know. when she was playing dress up with Sarah, the one dress she keeps going to is the dress that she owned. It's the dress that exemplifies her life before. There's just something really beautiful about that. So I just, I didn't realize it until like they really focused in on the plate. And I was like, that's the same dress. There's no way that they got a photo of her now. So this is from before. So when given the opportunity to be whoever she could be, to play dress up and pretend to be whoever she wanted, she was gravitating towards this dress that was hers. There was just something really beautiful and sweet about that and earnest. It's like a very earnest thing to do. And so I really, I really enjoyed that insight. Because she was always herself or she always tried to be herself too, but in spite of this place. And then the fact that she's buried in that dress, came in on that dress, she took it with her when she went. 
And that's that just hit me like a ton of bricks. It's like she came in as she left. Yeah. She didn't let this place break her. Yeah. Because in her last so. breaths, the only thing she can think about is her son. Yes, did she plead for Boyd to stop it? But once she accepted the fate, I am going to die. This is where it ends for me. She just keeps repeating, please take care of him. He's going right. to be alone. Because that's who she was. What Kenny said, though, too, there's just something so great. And this got me also. Well, what didn't get me in this episode? But what Kenny says is make her look nice. She would be really upset if she didn't look like her. And so not only the cleanup, not only the dress that she came in on, she came to this town with. Well, I don't know that or she maybe came even in on it, her person. but it was like in her bag or whatever. But listen, I'm taking like it and running, baby. Clothes, she was wearing but... that dress. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that if she didn't look like her, and isn't that true though? Isn't that right? That she came in as she left. She didn't let this place break her. Yeah. She would be really upset. Like he was still thinking of her. She would be really upset if she didn't look like her. And this is before, by the way, it's worth reminding the audience. This is before he heard what she had said to Boyd. He didn't even know that Boyd was there with her. And he thought of her. It was just, it was just a proof positive that he didn't have this thought because of that fact. He had that thought because that's how he knew her. He yeah. knew that she would be upset if she was left like that. She didn't look well, like her. And Rachel he would be said upset that's, too. That's badass mom S. S. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it is. Just but like living lady. that lesson through life. Because it's one thing to say the thing. And she did. She said lots of things to Kenny. And he knows her better than she knows herself too. You're only annoyed with Jade because you like those kinds of people. You like people that annoy you. Remember when, how annoyed she was when Jade first lived in their house? Mm -hmm. Again, something so endearing about these little moments that you catch between those two. Well, it says so much about the writing. When Jade stops and looks at her and says, we'll take you with when we go. They've only had a handful of scenes together, but you felt that connection for them. That's good writing. Walking Dead level writing. Yeah. We've seen so little from these people. These seasons are short. This isn't a 24-episode, hour-long drama on primetime television. And yet I feel such a strong connection the to these characters. And you know how they're going to react in certain situations. And you can feel their pain, even though we don't know them that well. Right. And so this is a good opportunity to kind of go back to something that Rachel had said earlier. I like this little reveal, but it should only take one season and then move on to a new problem from the next season for the next season that's probably yeah. what she meant. and i had said this in our season one recap because it's not for everybody but it's kind of the way television is going though this we're of a certain age where we remember tons of commercials uh, th throughout the episodes and that shows were written with commercials in mind even this show by the way they have these commercial break uh, dissolves in between scenes but shows are have been written in the last i would say 10 years for binging and so when you take a tremendous step back and consider that. Now, listen, you and me, we may not like that because we're doing this week by week. They're, these episodes are being released week by week. They're not re being released whole cloth all at once for a reason. There's a magical moment in taking in these episodes week by week that I'm very much appreciating. These episodes are a lot. Every episode is a lot. And so to be able to digest these episodes week by week, for those who are privileged enough to watch it week by week, uh, instead of binging, they're trying to keep that flame alive of having that magic of waiting week to week, but acknowledging the fact that something I said in the season one recap, which is my only big negative was that they were paying too much service to the arc or arcs that they were building and not enough service to the individual episodes, in my opinion. Okay. And it's not a huge ding because this goes to the ultimate nag that I think Sharon D and Rachel has, which is they're building mystery on top of mystery on top of mystery. But no, but if you're doing it all in the service of the big arc, the big mystery, the, all, the whole thing, yeah, you can slow play the season. Nay, slow play the seasons, because once you step back from five seasons worth, let's say, of From, let's say there's five seasons, and you see the whole picture, it needed to happen this way for you to fully appreciate it. Now, I said the same thing about fear because that was their intention from season four is to build up a grand narrative that would ultimately mm -hmm. make sense when seen from a distance. Did they accomplish that? I'm not ready to say that. I feel like I do need to see the seasons I again to kind it of for maybe you. make that determination, but... No. I should say this. Had the writing been stronger for the last season then maybe it could have gone that way. But unfortunately, even though there were real moments of light in the last season, unfortunately, overall, it was not well written. 
Right. And we do know some of the behind and the rushed, scenes reasons And it rushed for to that. an end. Oh, AMC pulled the plug on the funding. And so they had yep. to limit their episode. 12 episodes instead of 16. So they cut basically whole characters out to service mm -hmm. what yep. they could of Which, the yeah, remaining narrative. Yeah, I mean, narrative. that's the cards they were dealt. I'm not saying that it's on the writers 100%. It's not. And I understand the argument of, well, look, you make the best of what you can with what you've got. And you make that really good. But... I don't know. Maybe there were many people on that table saying, let's just take chances. If we're going to do it, we're, we're not going to be able to do it good enough to satisfy people. So we're going to take as many chances as humanly possible to make it at least ballsy and innovative yeah. and whatever. Did it work? Did it not work? That's for you to decide. I'm not yeah. ready. I'm not going to relitigate fear. Like going back to the point of this, from what I'm seeing right now, I feel like I'm getting answers after two slash you know, into the third season. Yeah. And yeah. it's satisfactory enough for me to be able to accept the weight. And isn't that kind of what we all need a little bit more of? I think a, so. A little bit of delayed gratification. Oh, I'm a big proponent of delayed gratification. Everything in our society now is instant gratification or near instant gratification. You want something, you order it on Amazon, it can be there the next morning. You want something, you can worse. order it from DoorDash and it can literally be at your house in 30 minutes to an hour. Everything is here now, right now, right now, right now, right now, right now, because that's the level of convenience that our society is hit. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing. With growth comes convenience. And so that is a blessing that we have as the people that live in the world that exists today. However, we've lost the feeling of working towards something and receiving that gratification later. It's why people like to slow down and plant their own gardens and why people got really into that in COVID because you got a moment to like step back from your life and take a breath. And we had forgotten how to breathe for so long. 100%. It was like the bread making to taking yeah. time to make something with your Everybody hands. Everybody was talking yeah. about, I want a slower life. I want a slower life. It's actually how I landed on what I did, which is ultimately that if I could just be at home, I would be. I would like a slow life. Then, yeah. There's a bigger conversation about, oh, the Walking Dead universe might give me that. Oh, I wish I was there. Anyway. I it's why I relate to it so highly. That. Anyway. It goes further than that, though, because there's that sense of entitlement. Why can't I have this? And not only entitlement, but for free. It yeah, starts yeah. with the, ugh, commercials. Ugh, but this is beneath me. But because of the commercials, you're getting the thing for free. Yeah. And no, also, but it's, everything is for me. Everything <laughs> is for me. I want it. I just, I'm supposed to get it. Then you get angry when you don't get it, but you're getting it for free. And I get the arguments that they may have, but nobody takes a step back and goes, aren't you in a, just a charmed, blessed life to be able to have this as a thing to exist in the world a little easier? We are very much Come on, so. man. When you feel entitled to everything, nothing is worth celebrating. Celebrating is the right word. There's no feast. There's no fest in the things well, yeah, that you because you haven't do. labored over the harvest. Exactly. You just got it. There is a right word for this. It's gratification, Dave. <laughs> it's not special anymore. Yeah. Is really what it is. It's just something I get and I should always get. You take it for granted. And so I like that we can kind of bring it back to celebration and that, well, yeah, shouldn't we be making every day count instead of just saying, but I'm supposed to get the thing and I'm going to get mad if I don't get it, even though I don't, I criticize it all the time, right? Like these shows, we criticize mm -hmm. them all the time and say, so why don't they tell me answers now? Because I want them now and I should lay get them of, now. Lay off for Rachel. Lay off for Rachel. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm saying that to make an absurd point. <laughs> Said I feel attacked. Largely not targeting anybody <laughs> in particular. I'm trying to say that this show is doing a really good job of exemplifying that, not just, and again, in a show don't tell way, but they do a little bit of the tell because this will bring us back to Henry and Tabitha because that entire final scene is narrated, yeah, in part by Henry. Henry Cavanaugh yes, he's saying uh, what his wife Miranda said in her acid trip and probably continued to say after that acid trip because eventually she does leave with the kids to the stuck place to try to free the children from the tower. And it was so sweet. It, it accurately paints the scene that they're in right now in the funeral, how they're all lost. And when they've lost all hope, they held on to each other. Well, what was interesting too oh. about Miranda's foresight, I might say, is that that's mentioned in season two. Elgin has a premonition of the town. He dreams about it. He has a premonition that they're going to get there. Bad stuff's going to happen. He wakes up is why he throws up on Randall because he's like, "This we got to go. We can't be here. This place is horrible. When that gets brought <laughs> not up, what they see, but yeah, when that gets brought up, 
I think it's Donna. I can't remember exactly, but she says, yes, people have dreams about this place before they get here or they mm. they see it before they get here. That's mentioned. So this is not the first time that this has happened. This wasn't the last time that this will happen. This is part of it. And threes, because Miranda sees it, Tabitha mm-hmm. sees it, and in a way, Elgin sees it. Well, and maybe somebody that, else will be chosen to save the children now. No, nobody well. else. Nobody else. It's just three. Again, threes. Again, I am no, I'm veering. I'm like touching on the moon wears pants. Maybe it's something that's three thing. I'm actually finding myself more excited to see Tabitha's storyline, which I didn't think would be the case because it is pretty dry. There's not a lot of action to it. But it's because you're getting fed information finally. And so it's like, yes, just I want to go back to that. Like, what were you guys talking about? I want to know what's in the basement. What's in the basement? I'm quoting you, girl. Oh, it's so intentional. And it goes to delaying gratification. You want to know. know. I know. You want to know. Nope. Nope. Not yet, Bridget. One of the things that I had said in the last episode, which was the first of the season. That's fine. That's cool. Was, man, if they don't pick this up somehow and can basically lift everybody off off the floor after the last episode. They got to work really hard to get us in. Where, and then they brought this powerhouse episode with Ricky. He just brought it across mm-hmm. the board. I I'm, am very much looking forward to Sunday as of right now, which I have to say, like, one, I didn't experience the week to week with this show prior to this because it was on like a fairly long hiatus. And that's when I watched it. Like I said, nothing will ever be The Walking Dead flagship. Nothing will ever be that again for me. But I like that I'm looking forward to Sunday. It makes me feel nostalgic. Yeah, I was going to up the ante a little bit because for as much of, as I really, really enjoy Silo, so much, in some senses, they do have some delayed gratification, but they give you something. They give you, mm-hmm. again, like what Rachel said in the chat, I need small snacks between the big meals. Silo gives you that. It says it doesn't waste time making you wait for some things. It just, it'll slowly drips the things that you're wanting to know while establishing, laying the groundwork for other mysteries way ahead of time. But I gotta say, Bridget, I think I'm on the same page as you in terms of excitability. I can wait for Silo Season 2. I cannot wait for the next episode of From. I'm I'm with you now on the same page. You've established it a while ago. I wasn't quite there yet, but I'm here now. So (laughs) if you like what you've heard and you're feeling the same way, maybe you're not, I'd really Really like like to to know. Head on over to ratethispodcast.com slash squawkingdead, five stars and a cabbage. Is all we need to know that you love us. But tell us what you liked. Tell us what you didn't like. Tell us what you really, really think about this episode, good or bad, good or ill. Please tell us after every single episode because it counts. It means something. Make today count by leaving us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform. Leave a comment on this YouTube video. Please, it really helps with visibility. Like the video. Like it even if you don't like it. Spare us a thought. But if you really are really enjoying this episode, throw us a tip for starters. You'll get instant forever access to our Discord, the ability to stream all the episodes we've ever done unedited, as well as peruse my pre-squawk insights where there's a lot of moon wears pants sometimes. And the things, most of them I do not say in these episodes, but if you really want to see some moon wear pants, just read the notes. But also some really great source links. So you, you tipped us. That's great. I really do appreciate that. And you do get something out of it immediately forever in the case of the Discord access. But say you want to see this podcast survive, just like the people on this show, you want them to live. Please consider joining a membership tier for as little as $4 a month. You can join the Walkers tier, get more access to our Discord, forever access to our unedited insights, as well as the pre pre squawk notes, some freebies in the Kofi shop. And if you happen to join the Whispers, Survivors, and Great M tier, you will get a free classic t-shirt upon signing up, the ability to join us in our Jackbox Games live streams, some extras that you will get in the Whispers tier, which is the ability to join us live when we break the news coming out of conventions. If you happen to join the Survivors and Great M tier, you can join with your face mouth mic and head alongside us, breaking down these episodes. And if you happen to be a producer type, one of those people that likes to tell us what to do, well, you get the chance But when you join the Great M tier because you'll be able to obtain the core role in our Discord server 
wherein you'll be a part of our private conversations, our budget meetings, our discussions about whether we should or shouldn't go to a con, and maybe give us a little bit of guidance because you want this podcast to survive, just like the people on the show, goddammit. Well, I hope you do that at ko-fi.com slash squawkingdead or patreon.com slash squawkingdead. We prefer the former, but you could do the latter. That's why we have it. I've been your host, David Cameo, and I was joined by Bridget, ko-fi.com slash punkybrewster. That's P-U-N-K-Y-B-R-U-I-S-E-T-E-R. And of course, Rachel in the chat, that's Cosmon09. Rachel Burke, she waves. Wow, I read it. <laughs> we'll have not only this episode to record next week, but The Walking Dead Daryl Dixon, the second episode. And, and who knows when we'll next record, because we're going to be at Spookala, baby. That was the second thing that I was supposed to mention the other day, the positive <laughs> housekeeping. See, I, you remembered for me that I didn't remember at all. A day later. <laughs> Uh, yes, we're going to be at Spookala this weekend in in around the Tampa area of Florida. So if you happen to be in the area, just like Heather, we're going to meet Heather down there. Come and join us. Say hi. We're going to be giving out a variety of free stickers, by the way, as well as we have some T-shirts for sale that I'm going to be bringing this whole setup thing. I know it's <laughs> a bit much, but uh, we're just going to be there to say hi to you. We're not going to do anything extra. We're not going to go out of our way to do th- we, We're only going to be there for you. We're going to be sharing a table with Suki Martinson, artist extraordinaire and guess what we're going to be right near the photo op area so you will undoubtedly see us suki was upset about that but i said girl they can use your art to sign the autographs Mm -hmm. what are you complaining about girl i actually i need a photo i'm sad because i'm gonna be next to all of her art and i will undoubtedly spend money that i do not need to be Uh. spending all right, well, I'll bring some but cash. It's too with me good. So you can get that Her done. art is too good. <laughs> it is too good. I hope to see you there, and uh, we'll see you real soon. We'll see you. Be the there or coverage. be an edge lord, I guess. Be there or wait, wait, wait. <laughs> no, wait. that's it. That's it. No, there's no Gross. satisfaction for you. Just like from, there's Gross. no satisfaction. <laughs> Gross. I have to be real quiet because I am currently recording this voiceover at the end of this very podcast episode at 1.34 a.m. Saturday morning in Tampa, Florida, at least the Tampa area, where Bridget and I are attending Spookala. We had a very, very, very long day, at least I did, waking up at 4 a.m. to catch a 7 a.m. flight that I missed, getting on another flight, having the car rental place, give up our reservation and paying probably twice and a half as much as I was going to normally, losing my long-term parking at LaGuardia that morning, which is why I missed the flight. But some positives came out of it. We saw Suki that day. We got her some sales. <laughs> we were setting up the rest of the day that remained. And it was pretty, pretty sweet for the first day. Can't wait to see some of you guys on Saturday. But you're not here for that right now. You might be. You didn't know you might be, but here you are. You're here because this is the part in the podcast where we shout out our whispers, survivors, and great M tier members in reverse order because we always start with the higher tiers to give them a little bit more juice because that's what they're paying for, even if they don't really care too much about that. Starting with the one and the only great M tier member, we have at Real Ryan GM on X and Instagram. Sadly to say, we do not have any survivors to your members but you could be one of them we already listed some of the benefits that they receive when signing up but head on over to either ko-fi.com slash squawkingdead or patreon.com slash squawkingdead to see the full list of features head over to the Kofi shop afterwards to see what benefits they receive what freebies moving on to our whispers to your members we have at judith.morton on instagram aiden atkin who you can get to at ko-fi.com slash aiden atkin and lastly the facebook ladies at sandy.d.morrison and at kim.rowley the number one like i said in the episode so it feels like From is really, really starting to go somewhere there. That's really touching and revealing. And the seeds that they planted throughout season one and season two seem to be bearing some rotten fruit that Fatima is currently enjoying. In the meantime, just remember that we are Squawking Dad. Squawking Dad.